All right, ready to roll? Cool. So uh, I'm a neuroscientist, by the way, and I'm the one that we selected to do the intro to genetics. Uh, I've been doing imaging genetics the last five years, so I think I kind of have an outsider's perspective on genetics. And the, whole, the goal of this talk is really to give you a language to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about different genetic analyses. So it's, it's going to be a pretty broad overview. Um, my goal is not for you to be able to draw out the cell cycle or uh, draw a Punnett square. Actually, I might have you draw a Punnett square. We'll see. Um, so anyway, so that's the goal here. I didn't know that this was going to be recorded. So there is a, a picture of my wife halfway through, and she may be upset that I uh, <laughs> have a recorded on here. So it's something to look forward to. All right. So here are the, the three topics I'm going to touch on. I'm going to go over DNA very briefly and talk about the cell cycle, talk about the two different types of... Um, of cell division that produces both stable cell types that are, are replicates and diverse cell types, which are really important for the way we understand genetic variation. Um, then I'll go into Mendelian genetics really briefly and molecular genetics, again, just to kind of give a language for where we're going uh, as a group this week. So just in the DNA and cell cycle, my goal is first to give you an overview of the cell cycle and then to demonstrate how cell division contributes to genetic variation. So that's where we're headed. So I'm going to start out really briefly, and I'm sure this is a review for, for most people in this room. Um, but DNA is doxyribonucleic acid. Uh, it's a stable molecule that can be copied and transmitted, which is really important, uh, the stability of it. And it can be transmitted to daughter cells. Uh, it contains the blueprints for making RNA. So you're going to hear a lot about us talking about DNA to RNA to protein this week. Um, the structure has a sugar phosphate backbone, which gives it its stability. Um, the complementary base pairs are made up of adenine, uh, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And whenever we're talking about a base pair, so you can see the ATs here and uh, the GCs here, you're going to hear those four letters over and over again. And whenever we're talking about a base pair, we're talking about one rung on this ladder of DNA. So you need to know that A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. And when we start talking about uh, DNA replication, that becomes really important because that kind of information is used um, downstream to be able to replicate DNA. So human DNA is arranged into 24 chromosomes. You have 22 autosomes. So you're, you're going to hear us talk about autosomal dominant conditions or autosomal recessive conditions. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about variation that's on these 22 autosomes. And then you have two allosomes, the X and Y chromosome. Um, most cells in the human body are diploid. When we are talking about diploid cells, we're talking about cells that have two copies of each chromosome, um, except sperm and egg cells, which are haploid, meaning they have one copy of each chromosome, which is obviously very important for human replication. Uh, all cells derive from a single diploid cell, which is a zygote, has one from mom, one from dad. And then the division of cells and the passing of genetic information is an essential component of our basic biology, so it's really important to understand so at the heart of the cell cycle is the process of cellular division. So the cell cycle is made up of uh, a mitosis phase and then an interphase. And I'll just go over these briefly again, mostly as a review for people, I'm sure. Um, first is the G1 phase. And this is kind of decision time. This is where the cell is deciding whether or not it's going to go on to the S phase um, and move on to DNA replication, or if it's going to hang out in sort of the resting G0 phase, move on to apoptosis, so a cellular death, move on to senescence or uh, meiosis, which I'll talk about as well. The S phase is where DNA replication happens. And there are actually um, cellular regulators that can differentiate between DNA that's been replicated versus hasn't been replicated. And because of that, that DNA replication process only happens one time in the cell cycle. Also very important. Um, and then when the G2 phase, the cell is sort of getting ready for the, the mitosis phase. And that's when you start to have growth of both the chromosomes and the cell. Uh, you also have protein translation that is important to actually allow the cell to do what it needs to do. So what's the mitosis phase? And this is all called interphase. So if we talk about interphase, we're talking about all of these parts of the cell cycle. So sort of a reminder for everyone, everyone kind of on board with this, or is this all new to everyone? This is all new. Cool. Great. So if you have questions, don't ask me. Ask one of the great geneticists in the room. Um, or ask now, and I'll defer the question to someone else. Uh, so this is, the, this is what mitosis looks like. These are the six 
stages of mitosis. Again, we are not going to look for you to reproduce this in any way, but it's important to sort of understand. I think the most important thing to take away from this is that mitosis is the process in most cells where you end up with two identical cells at the end of the process. Okay, so you start with uh, the centrosomes kind of migrate to the, the, the poles of the cell, and you start to have uh, the nuclear membrane break apart. And as that breaks apart, these, the chromosomes, uh, this is following DNA replication, right? So at this point, you have a copy of each chromosome, and they're hanging out together on a, centri on a centromere, and we call those two halves of that uh, sister chromatids. And what happens is those chromosomes, those um, two sister chromatids, move towards the center of the, the cell, and these uh, centrosomes have uh, microtubules, which we're familiar with in Alzheimer's disease for other reasons, but that kind of hold these uh, chromosomes together right in the middle of, of the cell at the equatorial plane. And then towards uh, the end and anaphase, those sister chromatids are actually pulled apart. So what you end up with is two exact copies of the chromosome that are now pulled into opposite sides of the cell. And at the end of uh, this mitosis process, you have cytokinesis, where you actually have the two cells separate. So what you have at the end is two cells with identical DNA, identical chromosomes in each side. They're, that's not always true. These are not always identical. But we're not going to talk about that at all. So someone else will talk about that, maybe. I don't know. Um, but it is important to know that in, in the mitosis process, typically what you have is two identical cells that form from one cell after DNA replication. Does that make sense? Yes. Are they almost identical Yeah, so not always. Because sometimes in DNA replication process, you do have mutations that happen. Okay. But it's not common. So when we talk, so you might hear people talk about somatic variation or somatic mutations. And that's talking about how across cells, sometimes even the DNA isn't identical. But in general, as a rule, it's two identical cells. Does that make sense? I'm probably adding caveats I don't need to add, but we, it might wondering. come up. So I wouldn't really think of it as like a mother oh, yeah. and two cells because it's really well, the beginning yeah. cell, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so at the end of the DNA replication process, you have two identical chromatids that are connected, and those are being pulled across to, to the two cells. So they're not going to be different from what, where it began. Okay. Yeah, and that, actually the, the stability of that replication process is absolutely vital because, you know, you're starting from one cell for all of us, and eventually it comes to all these cells that are holding the same DNA sequence. So it's really, really important that that's a stable process. And uh, apart from my caveat, that's typically the case. Okay. So the other type of cell division that's really important to know about is meiosis. So in meiosis, instead of going from a single cell with two copies of each chromosome to two cells with two copies of each chromosome, you start with a single cell with two copies of each chromosome, and you end up with four cells with one copy of each chromosome. And those are actually unique. Those are actually not the same, and it's really important that they're not the same in order to have genetic diversity. So I'll go over the early steps of um, meiosis one, mostly just to kind of explain where we're going and how this variation takes place that's so important. So at the beginning of meiosis one, you have DNA replication that happens again, and then you have homologous, the homologous chromosome. So now you have two copies, you have four copies really of each chromosome, and those two copies of the sister chromatids, so two copies of chromosomes, are the numbers getting confusing a little bit? It doesn't really matter. So the, the, the homologous chromosomes join together. And in this picture, it looks like they're next to each other, but that's not really how they are. They're actually on top of each other. And when those, those uh, chromosomes join together, the homologous chromosomes join together, the cell then pulls apart this way. So what happens is, depending on, so if you have, your, uh, you have each of your chromosomes lined up like this, and basically where it's sitting relative to, so whether it's mom or dad's, chromosome that's sitting on top or on bottom dictates whether or not it ends up in the top or bottom cell. Does that make sense? So if, I'm not actually going to move because I think I have a better picture of this here. So we call this the joining of homologous chromosomes we call synapsis. And it's held together by something called the synaptonemal complex, which holds it. And then it, it allows for two different methods of genetic diversity. The first is independent assortment, which is what I just started to describe. And I'll show in more detail in just a second. 
And the second is, across this entire synaptonemal complex, there's places where, where the DNA can actually cross over. So the chromosomes can swap, if that makes sense. So I'll show pictures of both of those things. So first, this is what I was just talking about, the idea of independent assortment. The idea is that um, you have replication that takes place, so now you've got uh, two copies of each chromosome. Within each of those copies, you have sister chromatids on each side. And whether this is on top or on bottom, so you can see here in this case, you know, all the dad chromosomes ended up sort of on the same side and all the mom ended up on the same side. But in this case, it flipped. And what happens when it flips is now when this breaks apart in that stage that I just showed you where it separates like this, instead of having, you know, the two dad chromosomes hanging out here and the two mom here, now you have for chromosome, let's say this is chromosome one, you've got a dad's version here and mom's version here, or I probably flipped those, we'll say mom's version here and dad's version here, go pink and blue. Um, and then same here, right? So you have uh, dad's version here and mom's version here. So this, this is just an example of two chromosomes where you do this, but in the human uh, genome, we have 23, right? So instead we have two to the power of the 23rd, which is 48,388,608 different unique assortments just when you're talking about which chromosome ends up on top or bottom before that split takes place. So that alone is an incredible amount of diversity, but it actually can't explain the diversity that we have at the end of meiosis. So the second thing that happens is crossover. So crossover uh, includes breaking and rejoining one paternal and one maternal chromatid. So you have the same process that happens. This is a simplified picture, just so you can kind of get a sense of where in the process the, the crossover takes place. But here, instead of showing them on top, they're showing them next to each other. And you can see that there's these points where crossover takes place. So now, instead of just having uh, a, a chromosome that, that is entirely from mom and a chromosome that's entirely from dad, you have a crossover that takes place, and now you've got some from mom here and some from dad here. And here it's just showing two crossovers taking place, but it's actually all four of these are involved in that crossover process. So both the sister chromatids from both uh, parents are involved in the crossover. And as that crossover takes place, it actually changes the way uh, the chromosomes look. So now you've got these, what we call chiasmata at the middle. And when the pull apart happens, it's at these, this chiasmata where they're pulled apart. So you end up with DNA variation from both parents and you end up with the sorting that I was just talking about. So recombination, this process we call recombination and the other process we call uh, independent assortment. So one important uh, concept here in the recombination piece is that this is happening on a whole piece of the chromosome, right? It's not happening at a, at a nucleotide. So that means that, that when we have crossover like this, you're passing entire sections of the chromosome all at once. And so we're gonna talk about in more detail, I'm not sure if Allison's gonna go into this much or not, but uh, in linkage analyses, for example, we can't only look at, when we're talking about DNA variation, we have to understand it within the context of how recombination happens. And the amount of uh, DNA that's transitioned in this manner really dictates how specific of a window we can end up at. Yeah. Yes. Per yes. Um, are, are, some, uh, are some regions more susceptible to this than others? Like, what are the yes. influences uh, on this? Yeah, so one of the major influences is just the synaptonemal complex, which is where these crossovers can happen along that complex. So places that are more vulnerable to I'm vulnerable is the wrong word, but more likely to have recombination, we call recombination hotspots in the genome, and we'll talk a lot about those as well. So when we bring up things like recombination hotspots, those are spots that are more likely to have crossover in this process. Does any card-carrying geneticist want to jump in on that and give a better explanation? <laughs> you didn't forget? No? Okay. Yeah, I mean, right. And there are recombination maps that we'll yeah. see later on that have been uh, have quantified the amount of recombination at different um, locations, even by gender. Um, and is there, so you mentioned, you mentioned that sex might influence this, but are there individual, is there individual variation in how much recombination happens or population differences in how much recombination happens? Uh, I 
become the, the amount of um, so the recombination of uh, the frequency is, in, is in, I don't think is different, but what actually happens in older populations, so in African populations, you have a lot more time. So the, the regions are uh, that end up um, being correlated with each other, so in linkage to equilibrium end up being much smaller. So that's how you can find that in older populations compared with new and the opposite if you have an admixed population in particular mm -hmm. okay. plays yeah. out in that. And I think there are molecules that chaperone yes. that can determine these hotspots. So yep. like here you have nine yep. one of them. And there are some populations that are naturally occurring variations in that particular molecule which will then affect the um, likelihood of having a recombination event there on its own, right? That complex that, that dictates the utilization of the hotspot. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I'm not sure yes. how much of that was heard by the report. Can you <laughs> restate all of it? No. No, I cannot. No, I will not restate it. Um, you guys on the, here, the recording, are missing out on some great stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went over uh, phases of meiosis one and meiosis two. The easiest way to think about it is you've had all this recombination happen, you've had all of the uh, assortment happen, and now what you have is just mitosis of haploid cells. So at the end, you have the same process of mitosis that I already spoke about, but now instead of having the exact same chromosomes, the exact same sister chromatids that are being pulled apart, now there's variation within that. So what you end up at the very end is with single cells with single cells that have one copy of each chromosome that are completely unique from the others. Does that make sense? And here's just an overview of some alternative outcomes that you can imagine based on whether or not you know, this chromatid or this chromatid ends up in the gamete. So when we're talking about a gamete, that's what the single cell that has one copy of each chromosome. So summary, this, I actually don't know if you need to know this or not, so I'll go over it. Okay, so summary, mitosis is in all tissues, uh, diploid somatic cells. There's normally one round of DNA replication um, for a given cell division. Uh, the duration is very short, and recombination is rare and abnormal. So this is what we were talking about before. You do have changes that take place, but it's not the norm. And what you end up with is gen genetically identical cells. So that's mitosis. That's in the majority of the cells in your body. During meiosis, it's a specialized, it's specialized cells. Uh, they're haploid. There's only one round of replication per two cell divisions instead of per one cell division. Um, and it can take decades to complete. And what you end up with is genetically different cells as a result of both assortment and recombination. Has, has everyone cell, cell cycle experts now and mitosis and meiosis experts? So if you can think about the, the amount of time that this process, so if you're just thinking about, um, uh, if you're thinking about uh, reproductive timelines versus cell timelines that take place at, uh, you know, every day in your, in your body, the time frame for meiosis, depending on the organism and depending upon um, the, the specific cell type, can take a lot longer <laughs> for the recombination to take place. Yes? So I get that there's genetic diversity but then yeah. we also read that we share 99.5 percent of our DNA with other humans. Yes. So basic question: What's how do I if there's genetic diversity, but then we share all of our DNA? Is it the expression of the DNA that differs, or what's the, what's the diversity? No, that's right. So if you think about so in humans, we're sharing 99.9 percent .9 of our DNA. So all the things that I just said are irrelevant to that, right? Because what, all those parts that are the same, it doesn't matter if I sort it, it doesn't matter if I recombine it, it doesn't matter if I flip it, it's still going to be the same. But the variation that takes place just in that 0.9%, most of which are SNPs, which I think I'll touch on later in this talk, um, actually have a tremendous effect on, on phenotype. Right? So all the phenotypes that we're talking about that, that vary by populations are based on these very small, relatively speaking, given the size of the DNA uh, in, the human, in the human body, just those small 0.1% of, of variation contributes to all the 
phenotypic variation that we see. So it's pretty amazing. And I would add one comment, which is if, it, if you have a recombination that doesn't work, you don't have a viable creature. Right. Yeah. And so there's the, the natural selection part is very much so. Many accidents have happened. Many uh, terrible mutations have happened, and they don't make a viable human being at the end of them. So, and that happens all the time. There's mistakes. And they don't make for a viable pregnancy, and they don't come to term, or they don't survive infancy, etc. There's a whole lot of loss of non-viable creatures that's right. part of this. So the stuff that we see, the relationships that we see across people is because what we have in common is necessary to create a viable person or pretty close to Or cell or, right. Yeah. Yeah, great point. All right, so I'm going to move on to Mendelian genetics here. And again, this will be a pretty brief overview similar to what we just went through as a team. Uh, so the goals for this, I'm going to introduce Mendel's laws of inheritance, segregation, and independent assortment. And this is actually very related to what we just talked about in meiosis, uh, even though at the time, Mendel wouldn't have known what we know uh, on the molecular level. And um, I'll talk about pedigrees and how we use these Mendelian laws, how we can actually use them to inform genetics that we uh, run in human populations. So this is Gregor Mendel. Um, he studied the pea plant. And he, he sort of thought of heredity as the passing of traits from one generation to another. And most of his um, theories relied on the idea of dominance. Um, uh, I didn't know I was going to end up being recorded, so my bad. But <laughs> anyway, so this is uh, the, early, the early experiments of Mendel um, and how he came to de devise some of these Mendelian laws I'm going to bring up. So in really simple terms, the first thing that he did is he had violet flowers and white flowers. And what he looked at is only violet flowers that across all generations would always produce a violet flower, and only white flowers that across all generations, that's what it means by true breeding, would always produce a white flower. So once you have those two sort of pure phenotypes in the pea plant, you can cross them, and what you end up with is an F1 generation of what he termed a hybrid, a hybrid plant. And that plant always had a purple flower. So if you cross a pea plant that always produced a white flower with a pea plant that always produced a purple flower, you ended up always with a purple flower. But what's interesting is if you crossed two hybrid plants, what you ended up with always was a three to one ratio of purple to white flowers. So this three to one ratio is really important and his laws look to explain why this three to one ratio happens. Is everyone following steps so far? Okay. So why does this happen? So first, let's talk about the model of inheritance. His idea was that you had a phenotype. Let's call it, let's say this is a yellow flower and a green flower. Um, you have a phenotype that looks a certain way. So ignore the whole right side of the, of the figure for now. On the phenotype side, it's just what I just described. You have flowers that always produce yellow, flowers that always produce green. When you cross them, you always end up with yellow flowers. And then at F2, you end up with three yellow and one green ratio, right? So his idea was that you have genotypes that, th that underlie this phenotype that we're seeing. And the reason that you had a green flower in this case is because it was carrying two alleles for green. And the other flower was carrying two alleles for yellow. And that when you cross those two, you end up with a genotype that looks like this. This is what we would call a heterozygous genotype, where you have one copy of this allele, the, the yellow allele, and one copy of the green allele. And when you have this yellow and green allele, the yellow allele is dominant. So that means the phenotype is always going to be yellow. Now when you cross these together, what you end up with is 25% of the time, you end up with a Y and a Y. 50% of the time, you end up with a Y and a lowercase y, or a green, a yellow and a green. And 25% of the time, you end up with a Y and a Y. Green is only going to show up in the phenotype when there's not a dominant allele present. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, this can't completely describe what he saw because there's no reason to expect that sometimes this, these two Ys wouldn't show up down here, right? 
there's no reason to expect that it would always be this. Because it could be you need two genes, you need two alleles, so why can't these two alleles travel together? So the way that uh, Mendel sort of made sense of this is by the law of segregation. The idea being that each homozygous parent always passes a single allele in a gamete. So what we were just talking about before, you end up with gamete cells at the very end, and he was only talking about this in, in theoretical terms, but you end up with one of those alleles being present in the cross. So always one allele is contributed from this parent, and one allele is contributed from this parent. So that law of segregation means you're always going to end up with a hybrid. You're always going to end up with a heterozygote. Does that make sense? And then because of that heterozygote, so this is a Punnett square. I don't know if we're going to do these or not, but here's an example of one. And basically, just by doing, what you can do is take the genotypes from up here. So here you would have a Y, a, bit low, a capital Y, a capital Y, lowercase y, lowercase y. And you'd see that when you cross those over, you end up with big Y, little y, in all four corners of the Punnett square. So here you can see you end up with big Y, little y, big Y, little y, and you end up with the exact ratio that we just talked about, where you have 25% of the time you have a Y, Y, 50% of the time, so 25 here and 25 here, you end up with y, capital Y, lowercase y, and 25% of the time you end up with Y, Y. And this genotype pattern can completely explain the 3 to 1 ratio that you saw. Is everyone following that? So now there was, he also introduced the idea of independent assortment. So now what we're going to do is add another variable into the mix. So now we're not just talking about color, we're also talking about shape. And so in this example, this is what we would call a dihybrid cross, where you have a flower that is always yellow and always round. So in all generations, this is what the flower always looks like. This flower is always green and always not quite round. I don't know what you want to call that. Anyone have a name for it? Rough. 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 <laughs> always green and always rough. <laughs> so when you cross these two, what you're always going to end up with is a phenotype that is round and yellow. Now, if these things were traveling together, the ratio that you would expect is actually the same as the ratio of what we just saw. But if they're actually, if these two features if the roundness and the color are being transferred independently, if they're being sorted independently, then the ratio that you would expect is a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. And this is the Punnett square for that, which I'm not going to walk through every cell of it. Um, but it turns out when you actually do this experiment, this is the ratio you get, not a 3 to 1. And the idea is that individual alleles that produce a given phenotype are sorted independently, meaning that this phenotype is not dependent, the two aspects of this phenotype are not dependent on one another. They are independent processes which have independent genotypes which produce that phenotype. Does that make sense? So this is the idea of independent assortment. So we can actually use those features. Actually, I'll say one more thing about this really briefly. So this, the independent assortment idea works really, really well when you're talking about genes that are on separate chromosomes, right? Because of the assortment that I was just talking about. Well, what about genes that are close together on the same chromosome? That's where it kind of starts to fall apart a little bit, because we know from what we were just talking about, about, um, about cells reproducing, that you actually have crossover that happens at a chromosome level and actually pretty big parts of the chromosome. So then the independent assortment kind of falls apart. Turns out what the, uh, the genes that Mendel was looking at were always on separate chromosomes, and it worked quite well. Uh, but there are occasions where this law doesn't hold when the two are in linkage, if that makes sense. So we can actually extend these basic ideas to study human disease as well. And these are five different sort of Mendelian pedigree patterns that, will, that you may hear us talk about, or you may not. I might be wrong about this, but you'll probably hear us talk about autosomal dominant <laughs> conditions and autosomal recessive conditions. And then there's X-linked dominant, meaning these are uh, dominant features that are present on the X chromosome, which we'll be able to see sex differences in, right? And Y-linked, meaning that we'll be able to see sex differences as well because they're only present on the Y chromosome. So here's an example, and we're, I'm going to put you guys to the test here and see if you've learned everything about Punnett squares or not. So here we have a pedigree. And you may or may not see these this week. We'll find out. Um, but you have the squares are dad, the circles are mom. Uh, a disease carrier is colored in on the pedigree. Um, this is you know, generation one. This is the next generation down here. And the, the example that I'm giving here is an autosomal dominant example. 
meaning that if you're carrying a single copy of the allele, you're going you're to have the phenotype of the, let's say, disease. And if that's the case, so here we have examples at um, generation two who are carrying the disease. And uh, we can actually tell from this pedigree what are the chances that this individual here will be carrying the allele. So how would we figure this out? Yeah, work back up the tree. All right, so let's start here. What would be, how many alleles is this individual carrying? None. How many alleles is this person carrying? At least one. And then when we go to level two, so unfortunately we couldn't really know here, right, because we don't have enough information. So let's go to level two. Let's talk about this person. How many alleles is this person carrying? And how do we know that it's one? It's one parent, right. So now we know that this is a hybrid, right? This is a heterozygote. This is hard. I don't know, man. This is pretty, this is old school. I, yeah, I feel like, I feel threatened. Uh, uh, no, I'm uncomfortable. It makes me very uncomfortable. So, <laughs> it's hard to see it. Okay, so I'm talking about this right here. So we're going to go backwards. So we, from here, we know, so we know that this is a heterozygote carrier. How do we know that? Because one parent only is getting a allele from one of each parent, right? So we know that this parent is not a carrier because they don't have the phenotype. So that means this, this individual has to be heterozygous. Does that make sense? So now what we're talking about is what we just talked about. It's a simple Punnett square. We have a heterozygote and a homozygote. And when we cross those two, what's that Punnett square look like? Does anyone know? Do you want me to do it on the board? Yeah. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it on the board. All right, so I'm going to use Y, capital Y and lowercase y again. All right. So you've got capital Y, lowercase y. And you guys on the recording are missing out again. Some really good stuff. Lowercase y, lowercase y. I hope this works. We'll find out. <laughs> so capital Y, lowercase y, capital Y, lowercase y, lowercase y, lowercase y, lowercase y, lowercase y. So what's the chance that this person is going to carry the phenotype of this disease? Boom. One and two. You got it. You guys just learned Punnett squares and are now pedigree experts. Exactly. Yes? So also from this, you said we don't know if two has one or two copies. Right. But we do know, right? So if we yes, look we at do. three and four, and three specifically, and nine specifically, these are descendants of right. person number two who do not have the trait. So they must have inherited the non-diseased aspect of that thing from person number two and from person number one, which we already knew. So we know that person number yes. two had how many copies? Exactly one copy, not two copies. But Paul, we couldn't have known that until they had kids. Absolutely. Right, yes. Right, <laughs> yes. So I wasn't going to go, yes, that's right. So you can follow this line, right, in this line. Did everyone follow that second part of the logic? Okay. Yes, that's true. You can. Um, all right, so just other important concepts that I want to touch on very briefly because they might come up. The idea of codominance is that a heterozygote presents with an intermediate phenotype. So this is when the phenotype isn't completely dominant because you don't end up with an identical phenotype to the homozygous carrier, but you do have an intermediate phenotype, meaning if it's a disease, for example, maybe you're slightly worse than people who are not carrying an allele. Um, penetrance is the idea that the probability that the, a person with the genotype manifests the character. So this is what makes what we were just talking about very difficult, because sometimes it could be that you have a carrier in your pedigree who doesn't actually show the disease. And if that's the case, really difficult to use a pedigree to figure out what it is that you're looking at, right? Um, and that's just sort of a limitation that you need to uh, keep in mind when we're talking uh, about a given disease. So, yes? Right. Right. Yes, that's a great point. So when we're t when we're talking about penetrance, especially in age-related diseases, 
where do you draw the line, right? Like at what point is this disease not present or is it just that they didn't live long enough to show the disease? Um, yeah, it's great, great point. Uh, yeah. And uh, are you, are you going to talk about that at all? No. I, I think we only want an hour from me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, um, and then imprinting, I'm just bringing this up because it's kind of cool. There's certain conditions where it actually matters whether the allele was passed from your mom or your dad. So in some way, the cell seems to know where it came from. And there are certain diseases where if the, the allele is passed from mom, it doesn't matter, but if it's passed from dad, it does. So... If we're talking about imprinting, that's what we're talking about. And that's really well understood. We completely understand it. Not true. Uh, quanti okay, so quantitative traits. So I'm showing you some pretty, pretty cool examples of how Mendelian effects can uh, aid in the way that we interpret autosomal dominant diseases. Well, what about traits that are on a continuum? So the question is, can traits that are observed on a Gaussian distribution, on a normal distribution, be genetically determined in, Men in a Mendelian fashion? And the way that Mendelian geneticists have, have sort of thought about this idea is through polygenic theory. The idea is that if a characteristic of a given phenotype depends on a lot of small genotypic effects, then the distribution of the character will actually approximate a normal distribution. So what that looks like in pictures instead of words is this. So if you have in just a one locus model where a given phenotype, you have a, a phenotype that looks that's slightly better if you're carrying if you're a homozygous carrier of the, the, big, the, dom, the major allele or a homozygous carrier of the minor allele, you're slightly worse. You can see it's sort of Gaussian-ish if you turn your head and think about it the right way. Um, if you just bring in two loci, so now you have two genes that contribute to this, you can see that it already starts to widen out quite a bit. If you bring in three loci, now we're really starting to look pretty Gaussian. And you can imagine as you get many loci, what you end up with is really a continuous trait. Um, so this is the way that just this idea of dominance effect, and this is actually not assuming a dominant effect at all, um, you can end up with a distribution that looks pretty Gaussian just from multiple small genetic effects. Does this make sense? Would that be an example of height? Uh, does anyone know the genetics of height in the room? They could... yep. Yes, great example. <laughs> <laughs> like how many low size is that? I don't know. Um, yeah, and then any environmental factor that would contribute to that too could immediately smooth out that curve as well, right, within the population. So if you have even a few loci that are contributing, you can imagine in this example, if there's some environmental factor that contributes to that too, that's going to that's gonna smooth it out real quickly. So far for height, hundreds of loci. Incredibly polygenic. But for, accounting for what percent of variance in height? Each one a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, right? Because there's hundreds of them. So by t not <coughs> each one, but total. Mm -hmm. Oh, a uh, fair amount, and that's been to later discussions about heritability and so on. We will go to that. That'll come up in this talk. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's my understanding as well, but do you want to expand on that's all you want to say? Okay. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, I think... I think it's really important to, to keep in mind that this isn't assuming dominance either, right? So dominance is going to completely change some of these effects as well, and it's actually going to skew it slightly more towards a normal distribution because one allele is carrying so much of, of the variance, right? Um, so here's an, another concept that you'll hear us bring up quite a bit, perhaps, is regression to the mean. And it's the idea that if you have a particular distribution of a particular characteristic, it's always assumed that you know if you score up here that you're more likely to have children who are going to score really high as well. But actually, in genetic theory, the better way to think about it is that your, your offspring are more likely to be right between you and the population average, right? So you can see, like, these purple individuals here, their kids are going to sit with a mean that's right exactly halfway between 120 and 100, and uh, the same for the blue, same for green. And what you end up with, if you put all these together, is a, a distribution that's identical for the two generations. Yes? Can you describe the difference between co-dominance and this regression to the mean? So co-dominance being an intermediate phenotype, so how is that different from this? Yes, so they're different. So uh, intermediate phenotype, an example would be, um, let's say that you have uh, a disease. This is a terrible example. I really should have good examples off my head on this. But 
I could talk about that, but I don't know anything about it, so I won't. Do you want to give that example? I would say the same example, sickle cell traits as opposed to sickle cell anemia. Yep. Whereas kids with sickle cell anemia have a disease, and sickle cell trait is not a disease, but they have abnormal cells. Does that? That's so, It's not really pleiotro pleiotropy because it's not multiple phenotypes that you're talking about. It's the same phenotype that it's having an effect on, but the effect isn't to the degree of complete dominance, meaning that your phenotype isn't identical to those so who are homozygous carriers. Over to so it has an effect. So if you think about it on a continuous distribution, let's just say blood pressure. This isn't true, but let's just say that blood pressure were an example of this, where if you're a homozygous carrier of an allele that's causing you to be hypertensive, people who are carrying one copy may have blood pressures that are higher than people who are not carrying a copy, but they're not actually at the level of complete disease. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas the regression to the mean idea is just that if you're assuming random mating within a population, that you're actually going to have a step. Rather than these individuals who are at the high end of the distribution staying there, they're going to move towards the middle just because you're assuming that the distributions across the two populations are going to be identical. Yeah. Yes? When you have your your children, because you tended to be up this end, that doesn't necessarily mean that your children will also be up. I see. I can. Okay. So I see why you're getting confused yeah. then too. What so it's it's hard. So when you're thinking about codominance, you're not really thinking about this polygenic piece per se. You're thinking about a specific genotype for a specific trait, right? So in codominance, you're talking about heterozygous carriers of a given gene or a given allele that has a specific outcome. When you're talking about a continuous trait like this, you have so many contributors to this trait that, on average, you're going to end up being moved back towards the middle. So it's actually, does that make sense? Like the differentiation sort of at the level of analysis. Yeah. So this, uh, this is a very simplified model, assuming a single locus is contributing to this trait and that there's no dominance and that there's random mating. These are, of course, terrible assumptions that don't live up in, in the real world, right? We don't have random mating typically in human populations, you're going to mate with people who are more similar to you. But there's also dominance effects, and those dominance effects are actually going to pull it more towards regression to the mean. So the actual real life um, way that regression to the mean looks varies, but when you think about the genetic passing of a given trait, you need to think not about traits constantly getting better, but about on average populations being consistent across generations. Does that make sense? Yep. How does the dominance, wait, oh, no dominance. This is no dominance, yeah. Yeah, so if you can imagine, if there's a dominant allele that's present, that's always going to carry the effect. Yeah. So because of that, you would need two copies in order to be at an extreme, right? So anytime you're carrying a single copy, you're going to look more like the majority of individuals because there's dominance in the, in the Whereas, framework. Whereas the majority is that dominance sure. Yeah. I'm, So think of it in terms of what percentage of the population is carrying that allele. Whether it's better or worse is actually not relevant. Most people are going to be carrying it if it's frequent. Most people won't be carrying it if it's infrequent. And whatever most people are carrying, dominant or not, you're going to end up looking like most people. Does that make sense? Uh, theoretical world, that's not true. There. Yes. That was a complete hypothetical non existent phenotype in a non existent world. That depends on one gene. Uh, yeah. So, the other thing that we'll talk about is heritability, and we just brought this up a second ago. So, if you're going to talk about heritability, a really bad question to ask is to what extent is a given trait genetic? And I think that's what we say a lot of times, but especially in population genetics, we can't ask that question. Because the correct question is, how much does difference in a given trait between people in a particular country at a particular time caused by their genetic differences, and how much is caused by their environmental differences or differences in life histories? So that when we're talking about heritability, we're talking about that very simple concept, not this concept. And the way that we break down heritability is you can think of it as you have a variation, variance in a given phenotype. And that variance is divided into uh, genetic effects and environmental effects. 
And basically, this because you're talking about variance in the phenotype, as this environment, this environment variance is equalized in whatever direction, the, the variance that's explained by the genotypic effect is going to go up. So that's why you have to take any heritability estimate you take, you have to take in the context of what you're looking at. Because it's going to vary across time. It's going to vary across environmental factors. And the amount that your genetics is contributing is going to depend on the amount of the environmental factors that are overwhelming the genetic effects or underwhelming that may be present. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I, I know that geneticists take gene environment interactions into account, but that's not in your equation. You yeah. There. Mm -hmm. Is that something that geneticists take into account when they're um, estimating um, heritability? So, honestly, when, often when you see a heritability estimate, it's a narrow sense heritability estimate, meaning that what they're what we're usually taking into account is the additive genetic effects. So all you're looking at is single locus additive effects pooled together. So how much do all of those single additive effects take into account? Very rarely are even dominant effects included in that, and even more rarely are interaction effects included in that. And the gene environment, I mean, you'd hope that in some degree you'd have a way to, to take that into the account in the environment variable. But in practice, you really don't, because you don't know you can't measure every environmental factor that's, that's impacting a given trait. So that's why it's so important to keep it in context, because you're really saying the heritability of a given trait, given these environmental factors that I've measured in this population at this time, is X. But whether the genetic load is um, you know, separated out into additive, dominant, and interaction or not, and whether or not you've manage to measure everything in the environment. My, I just am asking the question, are there ever any models of heritability where they're doing an interaction, making an effort to interact the terms? There are statistical models that do that. People just don't usually use them. For heritability, specifically. Yeah. I, OK. Why not? Do you know, is there a reason? I mean, it's hard. hard. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <How? laughs> It doesn't get you. It doesn't tell 
I was going to say that too, but <laughs> right, absolutely, yeah. Right. 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 So I'm going to kind of fly through the molecular genetics piece. I actually ran over. I didn't expect that to happen. Uh, so we'll, I'll run through this pretty quickly. Um, so the central dogma of molecular biology is that there's a one-direction pass of information, <clears throat> with two exceptions. So the idea is that you have DNA that's transcribed into RNA that's translated into a protein. And I'm going to go over this quick so that when we're talking about these different processes, when we start talking about RNA data, when we start talking about gene expression, and we start talking about proteomics and talking about translation, you understand what we're talking about. We're all talking using the same language. Um, so typically, the pass is, is, this, is in this direction. Uh, DNA polymerase um, helps with the, trans, with the, the DNA replication ports of the, part, portions of this, RNA polymerase uh, with gene expression portions, and ribosomes with the translation portion. The special of cases are reverse transcription, which goes in this direction, and RNA replication which doesn't involve the DNA piece. Um, but typically, we're going to talk about transcription to translation. Um, and sort of the underlying theory is that proteins don't code proteins, and proteins don't code RNA uh, or DNA. <clears throat> so going back to uh, the ATGC thing I brought up earlier and how they always travel in pairs, because of that, uh, you can use that information uh, for that replication process that I've been talking about throughout uh, the cell division pieces of this talk. Um, you can use the information to perfectly replicate, uh, turn a single strand of DNA into two complementary strands. Um, for transcription, uh, this is kind of important because we'll talk about different parts of a gene um, and within the DNA, <clears throat> and you might hear us talking about introns and exons, so during transcription, the exons within a gene are the portions of the gene that become the RNA at the very end. And these introns, these sort of GT to AG components of the, the gene, uh, are pulled out um, and the, the RNA is cleaved together, um, spliced together to form this RNA component. Uh, so when we're talking about introns, we're talking about sort of the non-coding region within the gene. We're talking about exons. We're talking about the portion of the gene that's going to become the RNA. Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, and then, so in, tra in the translation process, each every three nucleotides, so every three of those ATGC components forms a codon, and each of those codons forms an amino acid during the process of translation. And the reason that's really important, you can see what this looks like within the ribosome here, and you can look at this later uh, or look at cool videos online about exactly how this process works. But what's important about it is the, the variation that we have within the exon, um, we talk about in different terms of how that translation is affected. So we're going to talk a lot about SNPs this week. SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. Those are changes at the nucleotide level, so a given letter change within the DNA. <clears throat> These are typically biallelic, meaning they have two options. We mentioned earlier that 99.9% .9 of the DNA sequence is identical. 80% of that 0.1% difference is SNPs, these single nucleotide polymorphisms that we're going to talk about. Other variations that you see, the big other one is copy number variants, which are sections of the genome that are repeated, and the number of times that those sections are repeated, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about copy number variation. Sorry, I know I'm blowing through this, but um, I want to keep moving. So the coding versus non-coding regions. So when we talk about point mutations within coding regions, you might hear about a silent mutation. So that's an example. Here you have a TAT codon that produces uh, tryptophan, <clears throat> or tyrosine, sorry. And you can see here that it actually has no impact within this codon on what amino acid is produced. So that's silent. That means that there's a change in the exon, but it doesn't actually have an impact on what's translated during protein synthesis. 
The missense uh, happens when there's a replacement, and that re replacement actually has a, a change in the amino acid that you see. So you can see here, it goes from tryptophan to cysteine, and um, this is an example of the codon, a codon shift that actually has an effect on uh, the level of um, amino acid. A nonsense is when a change takes place and it causes an early stop. And a frame shift is when you have usually an addition of a nucleotide, and that completely changes how the protein is, is translated. So this is a complete change in the protein based on a single nucleotide addition within the exon. Yeah? So that strength <clears throat> Good question. So the letter itself is a SNP. Oh. Yeah. Yes. So this is, the reason it's important is because a lot of times we'll talk about SNP effects that take place within an exon, and we'll say like, oh, this is a missense mutation, or oh, this is a silent mutation. And what we're talking about is how this level of DNA variation actually impacts what happens at the level of amino acid. Yes? Yeah, well, both. Both of those will come up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most of the time when we're talking about SNPs, we're talking about the nucleotide level when we're talking about allele. But there's examples, especially in Alzheimer's disease, we have a lot of gene examples where we talk about allele, and we're really talking about a haplotype. Uh, so you'll see both of those come up. And we'll try to be specific when we're talking about them. Um, good question. So here's other references. If you want to learn more about this, um, go to this website. The Khan Academy stuff is actually really good on this topic. Um, and this book I used. If you have more questions, I'm happy to take them, or any of the other great geneticists here would be happy to take them too. So.